thanks guys for coming. Um, see some new faces, some returning faces, so that's always good. Um, hopefully, we'll have a couple more people that had confirmed. I hope they're not sitting in Maroon Door, um, but I'm sure they'll kind of file in. So this month, super excited about. I'm actually, you know, no offense, but happy to not be the one talking the whole time. Um, we brought a, a great guest in, Jamie Oliver, with Highlander Construction to go over a lot of not only, you know, budgeting on the rehab side of things, but, and, and I'll let Jamie get into his credentials a little bit. Um, I don't want to butcher that, but he's going to go through really the whole process from like a holistic standpoint, from the evaluation phase, you know, all the way through the, the budgeting and um, scope of work, kind of what you want to, um, what you want to be thinking about as far as strategy goes with the property. Is it going to be a good flip um are the numbers too tight you know going into it does it does it make sense to make it a rental are you getting it at the right purchase price based on what it needs what do you actually want to do to the property um you know busting out walls is a favorite thing of people's it seems like these days but but does that make sense does it make sense to try and get another bathroom in this place um things along those lines so with that said i'm gonna let jamie come up um Got a, a few deals and stuff that, that I want to throw out there towards the end. Uh, but, you know, we're not going to do a slide presentation today. It's just going to be our lovely faces up here, and um, I'll let Jamie take it away. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, propaganda here for anybody who wants to get it, uh, okay. brochure and cards. If anybody has any questions or wants to contact me at a different time um, to ask me questions, I'm always happy to talk to people. Um, as Cody said, my name is Jamie Oliver. Some of you may be familiar with Jamie Oliver, the Naked Chef. You guys heard of this <laughs> famous chef in the, across the world, um, out of England, has a TV yeah, show. Yeah. I'm Jamie Oliver, the Naked Contractor. <laughs> although I've been told by the police I have to stop doing that. So, anyway, um, I've been the owner of Highlander Construction for 25 years, and uh, we're a mid-sized general contractor builder in the area. Um, we've done a lot of projects, a lot of um, remodels, a lot of additions, um, a lot of commercial buildings. Um, for 11 years, I served on the Virginia Board of Contractors. I was appointed by, originally by, you're fine, um, by uh, Governor Bob McDonald, uh, who was a Republican, and then uh, was reappointed by Governor Terry McAuliffe, who was a Democrat. And I'd like to think that they uh, reappointed me out of both administrations because I worked hard on the board. and and took the, uh, the service to the Board of Contractors very seriously. So I'm really, really familiar with all the regulatory issues that go with the governance of your licenses. And that is, you know, as far as contractors are concerned. And that is one aspect of something I'll talk about when I get to the end of my presentation about whether we're going to use a licensed contractor to do work in a project or whether we're going to try to do it ourselves um, and, and some of the things that go around that. So um, like I said, my company start, was formed in uh, 1997. Um, we're a mid-sized contractor. Our office is in Blacksburg, and um, we've uh, been members of the Home Builders Association. And for a period of time, I had my real estate license, but uh, yeah. I found that Feel keeping up with all the continuing education and all the fees, and really, what I I really wanted to get my license so I could understand, you know, the things that the realtors go through when they're marketing and selling properties. Uh, and I, you know, I got a good education on that, and it helped me form better relationships with realtors for which we worked with over the years, but then ultimately decided that I wanted to focus on the construction and uh, not spend as much time. Plus, evidently people like to look at properties on Saturdays and um, that's when tech plays on, oh, yeah. in the fall. So I, uh, I didn't want to give up. It during I, I have a group, a good group of people that I tailgate with uh, on Saturdays and, uh, and I didn't want to give that up uh, you know, to pursue a career in real estate. So focused on the construction. Um, what I want to talk with you about today, uh, I, I noticed, first of all, thanks for the 2005 photo. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, Pre-teenager um, photo. I'm glad um, you noticed. <laughs> um, your title, How to Rehab for Big Profits. Um, let me just tell you right off the bat, the rehab is not where your big profits are going to come. It's the research from where your big profits are going to come. Construction costs have escalated considerably with the pandemic um, as materials are limited. Uh, labor continues to be 
a real challenge in our industry. Um, pricing is outrageous. I'm giving a student housing project right now in Blacksburg and got a, uh, a bid for the electrical work and it was twice my budget of what I had budgeted. And so, and I mean, that's several hundred thousand dollars of what I had budgeted. So um, it's, it's, you're really in a, in, as we continue to be in a housing shortage, which we are, um, and with interest rates being up, um, everybody's out there looking for deals, right? Everybody's looking for the property to flip or to find. And so it becomes more of a challenge. Um, and um, the, the real, because of cost and things, you're, it's not as easy as it used to be to go into a property and rehab it because you end up spending more money on it. So really, when you're going to rehab for big profits, you really need to research for big profits. I mean, that is where you're going to get your big profits is from the research, not from the rehab part of it, because I'm afraid those costs continue to escalate and will do so for some time. Um, builders over the lifetime of the industry used to be, the, the model was, I start as a young guy, I work for a construction company, then I go out on my own and I start with a specular project or a small remodel or doing an addition and I build my reputation and I move from speculative stuff until somebody hires me to do custom stuff and then along the way I start making money and then I start finding properties and I rehab them myself and turn them into a few rental properties and when I get to be 60, 65, I've had a good career in construction and over the time I've had 10 or 15 rental properties that I've put together with my sweat equity and all the resources that I could come along with owning a construction company and all of a sudden I have this revenue that's in place so I don't have to be out on the job site at 7 a.m. and in 50 degree, you know, 40 degree, 30 degree, 20 degree weather or 100 degree weather like we're having right now. Unfortunately, that model really has come to an end over the years. It is very, very difficult for builders to find properties just like it is for anybody else. Um, it used to be that the sweat equity would make up the difference of what you needed to borrow from a bank. So basically, you know, you could get into a property with a bunch of equity because you were doing it yourself. But that that has shrinked a lot. And so um, you don't see as many uh, builders, you know, amassing rental properties and using that as sort of their uh, cushion. In fact, I don't have that many rental properties. I have a few, um, but I don't have that many of them. Certainly fewer than I thought I would have at this point in my career. So um, again, it, the research part of it is really, really important. Um, and that brings me to my first point. Um, whenever you're looking at a property, you have to first determine the market for what you think you can get for rent or if you're going to sell the property, if you're going to flip the property, right? And, you know, you can look at a piece of property and be like, oh, it's, you know, it's a good location, but this and that. But if you don't know what your end numbers are first, what, what, what the market will bear, it, it's kind of hard to do any of the other planning. A lot of times people say, oh, you know, this is a great piece. Probably I can, I, you know, I, I know I'm going to be able to sell it and they get into it and there's more work than what they thought they were going to have to do and they spend more money and that margin shrinks because they kind of didn't do that up, up front. So it's really important that whenever you're looking at a piece of property, the very first thing you have to do is determine what can I get if this is, if I'm going to make this a rental and part of my portfolio or what do I realistically think I can do from a, you know, from a sales proceeds standpoint. That then helps you determine what is your budget for improvements. And your budget for improvements is going to be what you think you can make minus your cost of sales or your cost into it to achieve what you feel is a reasonable rate of return. And everybody's rate of return can be different. Some people may say, I'm not getting in to something unless I can make 15%. And if you can, that's great. Right now, if you're looking at things, that seven, eight, nine percent is a good number in today's market right now. I mean, it's just the way it is with the interest rates and and uh, the you know the tough conditions that we've had with labor and, and the and the rise of materials. If you're earning that seven, eight, nine percent, you know you're in a pretty good space. But you you have to determine based on your risk what rate of return that you want, and you do the math backwards. This is what I can, you know, what the market will bear. This is the rate of return that I expect to have. So this tells me what I can spend. 
Okay. That, that brings up an interesting point for me because I think a lot of times when I'm evaluating, I'm like, you know, I need to make 20 grand on this property to make it make sense, right? Or I need to, it's got to be $30,000 or I need to have X amount of equity in it. But I think a lot of times I lose, like, you don't think about that rate of return necessarily the same. So it's like, if you only put 10 grand in the property, but you're expecting to make 20 grand, you know, like I only have 10, 10,000 in it, that's a 200% return. So it's like, when you really compare, like you, you just want to keep that in mind, it seems like as you're going forward, because you've got 50 grand in the property, obviously that is different, you know, return value, like ROI. Yeah. Um, but sometimes I think people get a little, I don't want to say greedy, but a little, their you get expect, fixated their on expectations a get, get a little You get fixated on a number high. that you think you ought to be right, able to right. make. But realistically, sometimes that number, when you actually boil it down to what your rate of return is, right. you know, you're like, oh, man, I, I could have realistically done this property for half of that right. and still had an exceptional rate of return. And so um, it reminds me, I went to a uh, home show, a home expo in Las Vegas years ago for the International Builders Show, um, which is presented by the National Association of Home Builders. And one of the seminars that I went to was talking about... Uh, large scale builders and you know you know what they have to do to to make a profit and uh, the presenter was like you know if you're building five houses and you know and you're losing money you know what do we have to do to turn it around and somebody in the audience said well you got to do more volume and he was like wrong <laughs> if you're losing three thousand dollars a house and you do more volume you're going to lose more right. per house yeah. you know yes you can lower your overhead a teeny bit when you add volume. But if you don't have a formula for making money and making a rate of return that you, that for which you're planning, um, that's not, that's not a, a recipe for success. So we take that, we, we, we have in our mind what we want to make. We know uh, what the market will bear. And the difference between those two is our budget for improvements, right? Everybody, everybody kind of understand where we're going yep. with that? So then we have to determine what is our priority for improvements. Um, and typically when you go into a property, you're looking at it and you're like, oh, a little cabinetry, a, a coat of paint, maybe replace this flooring. And, and those are cosmetic improvements. The things that you need to be concerned about most up front is the, what I call the critical improvements. What is the soundness of the foundation? What is the soundness of the roof? making sure that we're not getting water infiltration. Water infiltration is the number one thing that damages property. The number one thing. And if you don't believe me, uh, I will cite you the Grand Canyon because water made the Grand Canyon. Running water. So you want to make sure that you're addressing that issue. Other issues are power. You know, what is our electrical issues? Heating and, and air conditioning. You know, you could go into a property and on day one the air conditioning is working. And halfway through your improvements, the air conditioning goes out, and now you're replacing an HVAC system, and that could be, you know, ten, fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars, depending on what kind of system, where it is, and so on and so forth. So understanding the critical things, it's easy to kind of go in and say, oh yeah, I know I can, you know, dress this up by putting a new bath vanity in here, and maybe you know doing a little, you know, paint or so on. But those those are the easy items. The, the items that you've got to pay attention to most are going to be those critical items regarding power, water, the soundness of the structure, the soundness of the roof, um, and you know, and the you know whether the plumbing fixtures and water heaters and stuff are working. So you want to be making sure you're doing those evaluation first. And it's a, and and so as you're prioritizing your improvement button, your realtor, if you're working with a realtor to flip the property or he just a friend who's giving you advice, may say, man, you can flip this if you make the bedroom look better and you make the kitchen look better. And you might do that, but in the process, if you don't take care of a problem with the foundation or the roof, the first rain you get, you're going to have a, a major problem. So when you start discussing, you know, that budget for improvements, you really need to do your research to determine that you need to go from a worst case scenario. And here's something else that I see whenever people look at doing improvements, whether it's to their own personal house, their commercial building, or if they're looking to flip something, everybody, it's human nature, takes the best case scenario. 
ah, if I do this and this and this, it's only going to cost this. And very rarely, when you're in the improvement business, does the best case scenario come to fruition. You, you know, it's not always the worst case scenario, but it's very, very rarely the best case. So if your rate, if your target rate of improvement, uh, rate of return based on the improvements that you want to do a property is based on your estimation of the best case scenario and it's tight, you're really ought to pass. You really ought to be like, gosh, because you could find yourself in trouble. And the one thing that none of us in this room want to do is lose money on a property. Right? That's the worst thing that can happen. I, I, I tell clients all the time, you know, when we're doing projects and you know, inevitably someone will ask for a change order, they want to make a change, and I'll price it for them, and they'll say, Oh gosh, you know, that sounds so expensive. And I'll say, Well, you know, there's a contingent for this, a contingent for that, and and uh, and I said, you know, this is what the market rate for these things are, and you know, that's the that's the cost of it. And they're like, Is there anything you can do? And I was like, yeah, I could take money out of my own pocket and cut a check for a portion of your improvements, but my wife gets really, really upset when I do that. So, you know, it's important that you understand what those potential costs can be. So the difference between cosmetic issues and critical issues, again, cosmetic flooring, cabinetry tops, paint, you know, plumbing fixtures or electrical fixtures, these are things that can really spruce up a space and make it more marketable but they're not necessarily addressing the core issues which could cost you the most money and be the most problematic in the space. Um, that brings me down to determining whether you want to engage a general contractor or you want to do the work yourself. And this is an age old argument. Um, as, as a builder, as a general contractor, I, come on in. I, I will tell you, you can spend, you can save money in a project if you don't pay me a margin to do it. But there are some things you have to think about in that scenario. Okay, whether you choose to do your own work or you choose to hire somebody, really comes down to: Do you have the experience and the knowledge to do the work well? Do you have the time and availability to do the work? And time and availability is part of a factor of what, of your rate of return. Right? Because your time is worth something, just like my time is worth something. And the last thing is, is what is the cost? So let's take an example of HVAC system. Okay? My company probably pays HVAC contractors for our portfolio work annually somewhere in the neighborhood of two hundred and fifty dollars to $450,000. Okay? So when I call them, they answer the phone because they're like, hey, this is a good client. And they know that if they don't give me good pricing, that there's three or four of the companies that I work with regularly that are likely to give me numbers. So they give me good, solid numbers, good market-based numbers. But when you call, especially if you're a first-time person, the person at the end of the phone is thinking, this is a one-time shot for me, and they're going to give you a different set of pricing. So if the cost of a project comes down to, yeah, I, I didn't pay a GC a margin, but I got bumped by eight or nine contractors, subcontractors, trade contractors and vendors in the process. Guess what? That probably paid for the GC and it cut your time in the project down by, by nine tenths. Instead of you being there every day and doing the work and Saturdays and Sundays and at night, you're there doing a walkthrough once a week until the project is done. So depending on the type of improvements that you're going to do, should direct you towards whether you need to hire a professional to help you. Um, if you go into a property and it simply needs some cabinets and some flooring and some paint, you don't need a general contractor. Okay? Those are all things that you can easily supervise, that you can easily find good vendors. And then once you do two or three, you'll start to get better pricing from those because they'll realize that you're going to start using them and they'll start giving you preferred or better pricing because you're being loyal to them and, and you develop a good relationship. But if you're getting into knocking down walls, reframing, having to solidify some structural aspect of the foundation or the roof, if you're getting into having to bring an electrician in, a plumber, um, you, know, you know, redoing the HVAC, these are all things that require a lot of expertise. And the last thing I'll say to you is when you go to do this work on your own, 
the trade contractors, even if they give you good pricing, they will get to you, but your work isn't going to be a top priority for them because they're not going to not come to my job site tomorrow for $400,000 of work this year and next year to come to your jobs, to your spot to make $4,000 one time. It takes time to build that relationship up and to, so that they know that it's an ongoing business. So when you kind of get into the discussion of you take your time and, and, and your level of expertise and your cost, and I, what I'll tell you is there's a lot of times where when you factor your time and the cost that I will get, or not my, you know, necessarily me, but other qualified builders, those, it can bring that, that margin down quite a bit. It's all of a sudden it's not as big of a difference as you originally thought. So, question on that yeah. real quick. <clears throat> is, there's a threshold for like the investor, right, that says, you know, this isn't that much stuff. Um, I feel like I can get, you know, somebody come out and paint, redo the trim, put a couple vanities in, put some lipstick on it. Is there also a threshold for like a general contractor where they say, this isn't worth my time, like there's not enough stuff here? Because I'm sure some investors have contacts in certain areas, but not others. Um, and even if a, taking down a wall is involved or adding a bathroom, is there, and this probably changes per contractor, I'm sure, but it does. is there a certain level of where most GCs are like, that's not a big enough job for me. You know, I, I would either just sub it out anyway or, yeah. or something like that. A absolutely. Yeah. And so let me tell you, for instance, in, our, in my own company, my general rule is $100,000. And, and, and part of that is because we're a, true, we're a true builder and GC. So we have qualified superintendents that are on the project. And I just can't guarantee the quality of a project if we don't have the correct supervision on the site. Um, the motto that we have with all of our superintendents is you get what you inspect, not what you expect. Okay? If you expect people to show up and do a good job, guess what? You're going to get screwed. You have to do your inspections every single day. You got to know what they're doing. You got to follow it. You got to watch it, and so on. And so I tell people when they call, "Hey, you know, I can refer you to some other folks who do, you know, smaller remodeling or smaller work, and you can get a better value for your money." We'll always help somebody when they call. I mean, if we have the capacity and the, and the volume to do it, but I'm always truthful in saying you're going to end up paying us more on this particular project than you would if you use somebody else because we're a larger company and we have superintendents and estimators and and uh, interior designer on staff and all, right. all those people get involved with with the project so a hundred thousand dollars is about our threshold now i have some exceptions to that one of the exceptions to that is if we built the project previously and some, like I said, we built a nice custom house for somebody and they come back to us two years later and say, we want to finish the basement. Yeah, we're going to do that and we're going to do it for a lower number because they already gave us their business. And they, you know, and especially if they've been great about referring us and, and so on and so forth, we're always going to honor the customers that we've had previously. The second time when we do things is when I get involved in a project and I'm an investor in a project. A lot of times, you know, if I'm working on a flip or something like that, and I don't do a tremendous amount of them, um, but if I do and I get involved in it, obviously I'm trying to bring the, the best numbers we can because I'm also a, an investor like you all are in the property and I want to maximize that. So we do have exceptions and we also have done some things. Um, I will tell you that my company is uh, very committed to helping veterans. Um, we've done a lot of projects to help veterans. Um, a few years ago, we did a, we built a, a 5,000, uh, 3,500 square foot house, uh, 5,000 when you added all the, the land and stuff in around it in Menacee outside for a veteran who lost two limbs in Afghanistan. And we did that in conjunction with Gary Sinise's national charity. And, um, and that was an awesome project. And we, we particularly, when somebody calls us and says, Hey, you know, um, we're a veteran, you know, that's just something that's near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. My dad is a, was, is a former uh, retired Marine. And so that's something that's really important. So we, we do make exceptions in that, but to your point, yeah. Um, and, and I'm, these are some friends of mine. So I'll, I'll just tell you, Ed Tuckler was shelf alternatives, fantastic builder, right? Great builder, not cheap. Right. Um, you know, he's not someone who's going to come in and do $10,000 of work for you. He just he has too many other projects that he can do. Um, 
But there are always, you know, the same thing with, say, Nancy Phillips, who's a great builder, or uh, Justin and Jason Boyle, good friends, and they do a great job, um, really. And, and I will say this, uh, we're blessed in the Newer Valley that we have a lot of great builders and remodelers. Uh, Tim with Blue Ridge is great, um, uh, really quality person. Um, I've said many times that if I wasn't my own builder and wasn't building my own stuff, I would have a hard time picking somebody because we have a lot of good ones. And, um, but these are also some of the larger, more experienced companies, and they're going to have a different threshold. Um, but there are also lots of young guys and young people, I don't know just guys, young people coming along in the industry um, that are looking, and this is how they get their start, right? So um, I think you know that uh, the younger guy, Caleb, who's, uh, who's doing some great work, commercial work. I can't remember his last name. Um, is that the... Oh, Caleb Chafin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Rinse it off. Um, and so, so there's a lot of you know younger. You did this one, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of younger folks that are coming along. They're doing great work, and and they're starting to build their business versus someone like me that's you know, there's waxing and waning right now. Yeah, I'm yeah. waxing and he's waning. So yeah. I'm, or, or vice versa. So, um, so yeah, there's always a threshold, um, and 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 that threshold is going to change based on economic conditions too, right? We go into a recession. And work starts drying up, and houses aren't selling. You're going to see a lot of people whose threshold is going to come way down. Right. Right. I mean, that's just the way it yeah. is. I mean, they'll, you know, the project when they were willing to, you know, weren't willing to do it for less than three hundred, it's now fifty thousand. You know. Right. Um, but right now in the marketplace, um, it's still a pretty active market, even with the interest rates where they are, especially in the Blacksburg market. Um, and so there's definitely a threshold. Um. I don't really think about it from a standpoint of um, the builder's threshold. What I really think about it is from the investor's um, improvement budget and what they can spend. Right. right? I mean, so I don't want to say, I think you can always find someone who's qualified to do work for you, even if it's small amounts sure. of work. I think you can always find someone qualified. And, and then once you start building relationships, you know, you can, it's easier. Right. Um, but, to, but you're going to deal with a threshold when you're using more experience. So, so I had another question. Yeah. Um, sorry, to, mm -hmm. I'll let you finish your, no, no. your presentation, but I was, I'm curious, you know, sitting around and like going into these properties ourselves, right? It's, it's, it's really hard to find someone who has the time, like as a contractor to meet you out there on the first visit or even the second visit to say, Okay, this is this is around what I'm looking at as far as budget goes. I know I know what I can spend based on the ARV and what I'm purchasing it for, but what are some tools that we can use or some like some ranges that you can you can expect in certain areas of the home like a new kitchen or a new bathroom, you know, is it is it a can you say, okay, for a bathroom, and we're not going all out here, like yeah. putting, you know, granite marble in the in the bathroom, but can I expect to spend four to seven thousand dollars on on a bathroom if I'm gutting it yeah. and remodeling it? Same thing for a kitchen or Yeah, so so know. I'll start that's a great question. And I, I I don't answer the phone myself nearly as much as I used to, because we have other people in the office too. I used to answer the phone every time it rang, you know, mm -hmm. for a lot of years, right? And and now we now that responsibility is shared. But I can't tell you. I mean, I if I had a, a hundred dollars for every time I got this question, I would have retired. Hey, uh, how you doing? I'm fine. How are you? I'm thinking. My wife and I are thinking about building something. What are you building for a square foot? Uh, I don't know. What are we building? Where are we building <laughs> right. it? Uh, you know, I, I I just that's an impossible question to ask, particularly or to answer, particularly because there's such a high range. Of it too. So if I say to you, Cody, uh, you know, what's it going to take for you to get a car? Well, your first question is, well, what kind of car? Is it new? Is it used? Mm -hmm. You know, what am I doing? Um, you, can, you can work off of some averages, but it's a dangerous precedent to work off averages, especially in a challenging market. The bottom line is um, it's better to go ahead and find someone that will work with you and giving you hard numbers. And I'm not saying that's easy. Um, because people are busy. Right. So if every single person in this room said, hey, Jamie said call him any time, and every one of you called me and said, can you come look at a property next week? I couldn't possibly go and look at every property with every one of you next week. 
but I could go to two of them or three of them. And I do that all the time. In fact, um, I'll tell you that I have a client that we just finished a 13,000 square foot house that I looked at properties with him for six years. And halfway through that six years, I, uh, I got to a point where the phone rang and I'd look and I'd be like, oh man, oh, it's, a whole, it's a whole other Friday of just driving around and looking at properties. You know, this, I, no, nothing's ever going to come from this. And then all of a sudden, you know, we, we end up with a multi-million dollar project out of it. And, and uh, you know, something did come from it. And so my thing is this, for me personally, I'm always interested in helping people to the best of my ability. I can't spend all day, every day, looking at properties for no compensation, but I'm certainly willing to do it on occasion. And I'm willing to go and look at stuff and say, hey, these are major areas of concern. Hey, this is, you know, this is the things you need to really look at. And I can give you some general ideas on the property. Now, there's a difference between how often you do that versus whether you're going to end up paying for that service or not paying for that service. I mean, I guess, um, the, I guess the big thing for me is being able to, you're trying to weed out properties that, you, yeah. that aren't worth me calling you about, right? right? So like if I walk into it and I'm like, okay, this needs the kitchen. It need, we need to take all the cabinets out, yeah. you know, gut it. How much is it going to cost in, well, a, in, in a range of, you know, can I, you know, the kitchen's going to be, you're right. That every there are a lot of things that there are a lot of things that play factors into it, but you have to be able to you have to be able to start weeding out things like as you walk through it. And if you don't, if you're not familiar with the range, you wouldn't okay. wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. Yep. And I'm sorry I didn't get to introduce myself. Because I'm new to the area. Congrats. Anyway, Welcome. So I came to town on six ten, and there was a little neighborhood over there. It looks like a low mid range neighborhood. Right? Mm -hmm. Older houses. So I'm not an agent, real estate agent. What is, what, is, what is the price point on those houses? Um, I'm not sure exactly what area you're talking about, but is it in Christiansburg? Yeah, I should come in on 610. There's a little neighborhood there, older houses. Okay. It looks like they those, should be flipping over. Yeah, so people are flipping those. It's like Park Street, um, that area what, with, of Christiansburg. Um, it depends on if it's fixed up or not. No. Yeah. Um, you're probably getting those, I don't know, 150000 200000 150000 house. That's your, that's your house. It's a yep. medium range house. Mm -hmm. You want it to be the nicest house in that neighborhood. So we're going to be putting the subway in the kitchen and the white cabinets and, you know, a nice mid range handle and maybe an island. And those kitchens are not super big. Mm -hmm. So, you know, should we do how much a square foot for a kitchen that is a mid range kitchen? Yeah, the square footage is probably helpful when you're like, because it does depend on the size of the house, depends on the size of the bathroom, depends on the size of the. You know. So let me dodge that question by an, by answering. I guess give us some tools yeah, to yeah. be able to do some of the work ourselves before yeah, no, I understand. Before we get to the point of... So you know. when a client comes in and they're talking to us about a remodel or an addition um, or a new build and we sit down and we start talking, I ask them questions so that I can give them that kind of range. Um, if I, if, you know, I say to Cody... You got some apartments in Giles, and you're looking to do studios. Mm -hmm. um, I know what your because I'm in the business. I, I know sort of what your max rent is going to be. So right off the bat, I know you're not going to Ideal down the street here. I mean, I love Ideal; they do a great job. But you're going. You're going. They, they don't have any low base cap. They're going to start grade, medium so, base and yeah, go yeah. from there, right? Right. So you know, we're probably talking about limiting the cabinet options by going to Lowe's or Home Depot. These are obviously the, the things that come off the shelf are going to be somewhat lower quality cabinetry. Um, but you can generally kind of get a sense if you're doing an L, you know, a general L shape, your cabinets are probably going to run a couple thousand dollars. 
You're probably going to look at 500 to 700 to install them with a qualified person if you're not doing it yourself. And then you have to decide what kind of tops you're going to do. And, and it's pretty easy to get pricing on tops. I mean, anybody can really call a granite company and say, what is your granite, you know, what are your tier one granite per foot, square foot costs? You know, you can call Lowe's and ask them what your pre-order uh, for MICA cost is going to be. I mean, those are things that you can do. It's really, really, I go back to the very first thing I said was, it's re really you have to identify where your market is so that you can identify what you have to do. If you're talking about smaller, older properties, smaller kitchens that maybe, you know, don't have space for islands. I mean, you probably are looking at a four to $8,000 range. If you go into a medium-sized house in like Woodland Hills in mm -hmm. Blacksburg, those houses may be 25 or 30 years old, but if you're rehabbing those, you're probably a 25 or $35,000 right. budget. Well, you've got, like your, to your point, you've got room in your margins that it brings it up to, those, to match those costs To match in the what area. the level is going to be. Right, so, right. so it's doing that research in front. And so, and so we, we engage our clients in a conversation about, what is it you want and what is your budget? And, uh, you know, people will start off by, you know, I want mahogany and I want the highest tier granite. And mm -hmm. I'm like, cool, that's $150,000. And they're like, okay, what can we do for twenty five? Right. And I'm like, maple yeah. with a tier one granite. Right, right. Okay. I mean, <laughs> you know, if that's what you, you know, if that's what yeah. you do. So, um, and I understand the difficulty of the evaluation process, which is when you're going in, you know, you, you don't necessarily have a, you know, you like don't a have a contract experience, right. so you're wondering. But I will tell you, pretty much any type of estimating ability that you want is available online, okay? Um, it's really funny. I, I hired a, a young person out of Virginia Tech a few years ago, and primarily what I, I helped him, I hired him to help us with administrative tasks and also to help take a little bit of the estimating load off of me, because at that time I was doing 100% of the estimating for the company for, for up front on projects. And we started the process, I bought some books for him, I got him a couple programs, a, a book on plan reading and whatever. Uh, he, was, he was a little slow to want to read those materials and study those materials, oh, okay. So one day he's like he's like I, I just don't know how to do this, and I and I and I said uh, we'll just we'll just say uh, schmo we'll just use that as a name. The schmo, you can Google anything. I was like Google, just type in the Google. How do I estimate a roof? And it popped up a, a formula thing that said the size and this and this and then like in thirty seconds he had put that information in and had answered. And I said you don't have to ask me how to do that. You can Google almost anything at this point and you can too you there are books that are out there that you can buy that give you the national averages of different kinds of construction work um you know uh drywall work and things like that but you can also if you will spend the time and make calls up front you can also kind of get answers from people before you even go to a property and so this is one of the things i was going to touch on if you're getting into this business and you want to do these evaluations your own on yourself up front, you're going to have to study and learn how to do some of these things. And some people are like, I don't want to study and I don't want to learn. If I can't pay someone to do it and still make a profit, I'm not going to do it. Guess what? That's great. That's kind of the way I feel about it, honestly, with my own properties. If I can't find a deal that I can do our normal construction with and still flip it, I'm probably not interested in it because I'm way too busy to spend a weekend sanding drywall. On the other hand, you can literally go through and build your kind of own database with the basics of how much things are going to cost. Let's talk about drywall, okay? There are lots of drywall contractors out there. You can literally call them and say, I'm thinking about doing a project. What do you, you, know, what do you usually charge per board? And most drywall guys will tell you, most drywall people will tell you, hey, I, we charge, uh, including the board, $55 a board or $65 a board. And that's like the sheetrock. The sheet Hung like, and finished yeah. sheetrock. Okay? 
And, and yes, there are changes. I mean, that's a standard board with an eight foot ceiling. If you want to go to a nine foot ceiling and you're doing four and a half foot board, it's going to be a little bit more. So you kind of got to know what you're, but then you just do the math. You take the plane of the wall, you break it down into square feet. You figure out how many, you know, how many boards you're going to use. And all these formulas are available by Googling every single one of them, but you got to do it. Mm -hmm. And so here's the thing. Your question to me is, how do we go in and kind of evaluate a property and before we even ask a GC to look at it? Well, you go to school. <laughs> you go to school and you figure out, you do some research. Or learn the hard way. Like, you, or, uh, or, or, <laughs> or lose. I, right. I, I'll never forget when I first got into construction, I went to a Virginia Home Builders event and the guy who ran the whole thing, Mike Tolson, John, remember Mike Tolson? The, the guy who ran the whole thing, he put his arm around, he's like, oh, we're so glad to have you here. He's like, he's like, you want to know how to make a million dollars in building? And I said, yes, sir. He goes, start off with two <laughs> because you're going to lose a million for the first right. few years that you do it, right? He's like, so, I mean, and that there's some truth to that. So, you know, the easy answer is there's no magic wand that you're going to wave short of bringing a professional in to do an evaluation of a property. And a professional will come in and do evaluations for mm -hmm. properties for you. They're just not going to do every property every time because they're going to, they just don't have the time right. to do that. Which is why you need to gain the skills to be able to. That's why you need to gain the out. skills. Yeah. And so, you know, you start with the, the things that you're not going to be able to figure out on your own is going to be the electrical, the critical systems that we talked about. These are systems and things that you're always going to need a professional who's got that experience and trade contractor to tell you. I mean, you're just not going to go in on your own without having electrical experience and say, this panel board and the breakers are great. I've got enough power for the things I want to do. Um, you're very rarely going to be able to go in to take the covers off the HVAC equipment and say, yeah, this coil looks right and it's not going to go on me. And, you know, and, and the ductwork is operating efficiently and so on. The cosmetic stuff is things that all of you could easily do, but you have to spend the time up front preparing for it. And this is work that you do before you go to a property. You spend a little time getting paint quotes on averages, drywall quotes. You go to the local, you know, floored in uh, Christiansburg or the LV flooring in, at Marketplace or these other places. You talk to them about the square footage of the average tiles that they sell. You talk to them about what it, the tile guys that you're using, the tile people that you're using. What are they, you know, what are they charging for square foot? You know, what if they're doing a... And, and, and these people want to sell you stuff, right? So they will spend time with you and sort of educate you on that process. And you basically can create a spreadsheet. You can create, you know, a Word document or something that you then when you go and, and sort of your own checklist and you can go to these properties and you can start evaluating. You know, it's e very easy to go to Lowe's. Or you can actually do it online. You can go to Lowe's online and look at their, their off-the-shelf cabinets are all listed online. So if you know that your dimension from this point to this point is eight feet and it doesn't have a sink in it, you could literally go and add up eight feet of cabinetry, wall and thing, and get an average of the off-the-shelf white base level available cabinetry and run some quick numbers on it. Okay. I know one thing that's helped us in that regard is like after you've done a few. Yeah. Um, like with our rentals, we were we were doing a lot of like buy, rehab, rent. Um, some of them we were kind of burring and doing a you know a refinance, pulling money out to buy another one. But we got to the point where we were using the same materials in every property that we were doing. So you knew like okay, we're right. putting tile in this bathroom. This is how big it is. This is how much we paid you know three months ago for the same tile. So we just have to do the calculation and and it's easy to figure out. That's how much we pay for the toilet, the tile shower. So and, the more you do it, the the easier it gets to walk in and say, okay. Absolutely. Is... The only caveat I would say to that is make a phone call before you before you sign off on the final number. Yeah, sure. Because the price, fluctua the price fluctuation is so crazy right now that you might have paid $8 a square foot for tile three months ago, and now it's 12 Right. Um, you know, particularly as one type of material runs out that was made under previous economic conditions, and now it's the new stuff is coming in and it's mm -hmm. under the new production and labor rates and things and taxes and regulations and all those other things. And it's just more expensive. 
And so it's always worthwhile to, to make a phone call. Sure. And so, you know, I guess, you know, one of the things when I, that when, when I spoke to Cody about coming and sort of doing this presentation was if, if you all came tonight expecting me to say, there's a magic wand and you use, you utter this phrase from Harry Potter and all of your estimating happens without you having to do any work. Yeah. It doesn't happen. The last thing is, is that you can always engage a relationship with somebody in which you pay people for their time. And if you are going, if your purpose is to end up having 25 rental properties, it probably makes sense to in, to engage in a relationship where you can get an impression, a, 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 a professional evaluation of a property um, prior to making a decision on it. And um, like I said, I, I think most builders will and, and developers will are willing to lend their time, uh, a portion of their time, to people getting into this industry and looking. It's just they can't do every property every time. You know, so, I mean, if Cody says, hey, man, I think I got a property. I want you to come look at it. Of course. I mean, Cody's my friend. We play cards together. I love taking Cody's money. It's one of my favorite things to do. It's been happening a lot oh, more recently. For oh, some oh, only, oh, the only person I like taking their money more is uh, Chris Hole, who's not here tonight. <laughs> but um, uh, but he calls me and says, he's my friend. I'm going to go look at the property with him. And, and I'm going to say to him, oh, man, I see this problem. I see that problem. You know, I can sort of give him some professional advice about, yeah, you're probably going to get in this, you're probably going to get in that. Then Cody has to make a decision. How, how much do I want to gamble on my own? Or am I interested in, you know, asking Jamie to do more of a professional uh, estimate of what these systems and these things are going to be? And for me personally, I tend to, prob I tend to do those on a very low margin but I have to cover the cost of the employees that work for us um, or else they wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be able to afford to have them on staff. Okay. So just a couple other quick notes I wanted to mention to you. Well, going back to deciding if you're going to do it yourself, again, experience and knowledge, your time and availability, and making sure you're factoring that in to what your overall cost is going to be, and then the actual cost. Um, I, I wrote down to tell you about sources of estimating because that's really the key to it is you spending some time getting a base knowledge of estimating. Um, and there are lots of sources. There are books. You can go into Amazon and type in a subject matter of estimating for rehab. Okay, You'll get 15 books that will come up. And these books are written by people like me who can no longer be in a job site. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and they will walk you through, this is how you do this, this is how you do that. But guess what? Just because when you buy the book, you have to read it. And you actually have to call and get the square foot number of what the drywall costs or whatever. Because there is no magic wand where those numbers are certainly going to materialize. And the other thing is, is when I go to look at a property, I haven't done the research most, most of the time. I mean, if, I, if I've been in that neighborhood before, maybe I'd have some knowledge of it. But when I go someplace like the neighborhood you're talking about, I'm not going to walk and be like, yep, I know that four houses sold for $400,000. In the last six months, Cody can look that information up, but I'm not going to have that knowledge. So I'm not going to tell you, yeah, you don't want to do the base Lowe's cabinets. You want to go with the the basic builder line that uh, you know that uh, Ryko has, mm -hmm. and 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 you're not going to want to go with just Formica, but let's go with a tier one granite because that's going to be in the same level of these other properties. But then you still have to make sure because much it, it it comes within your budget. Last but not least, and I'm happy to answer any questions, um, I, I do want to take, talk to you for a second about the Board of Contractors. Okay? Um, as, as I mentioned, I served on the Board of Contractors for 11 years. And the Board of Contractors is the body that regulates all licensed contractors. Okay? In Virginia, if you do more than $1,500 a work a year, as a contractor, you are required to have a contractor's license, to be licensed by the state of Virginia. It is not always enforced by the locality. I remember talking to Mary Pettit a few years ago, who is our esteemed Commonwealth attorney here in Montgomery County, and I was griping to her about the fact that 
we had had a rash of people that had called the board of contractors to complain about problems that they had on their sites. And it turned out that those problems were created because they, the, peop, the homeowners were using unlicensed subcontractors. The board of contractors doesn't regulate unlicensed subcontractors. The only thing that can happen is the low school prosecutor, the local commonwealth attorney, has to decide if they want to prosecute somebody who's operating as an unlicensed subcontractor. And therein lies the rub, because as Mary told me, Jamie, we hardly have the resources to, to go after the murderers and the drug dealers and the people who are you know, vi you know, you know, violently assaulting people. She's like, if some guy loses his job and he wants to go you know, build decks, I'm not going to prosecute that. And that created an interesting rub. But let me explain to you what the other side of that coin is. When you do your own personal project and, and you hire a general contractor who's licensed, you can always go to the board of contractors if there's something that's happening that doesn't seem right. You feel like someone's cheating you, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. You can go to that regulatory body and you can file a complaint against them. And it is fully investigated. And there's all sorts of repercussions when someone is found guilty of violating the regulatory standards that comes with a license. If you have an investment property, there's a, but there is a difference between your personal house and an investment property. Okay, One of the resources that the, boards of, the Board of Contractors has is called the Contractor Recovery Fund. Let's, you have a house um, that's your personal residence. You have work done. They, the contractor screws you. You try to go after them. They don't have any money. You can apply to get money back from the contractor's recovery fund. It's like a last resort insurance policy. But that contractor recovery fund is only available for your primary residence. It is not applicable to investment property. Okay. Now, you can still file a complaint and it will be adjudicated and there are still ramifications for a contractor who violates standards on a commercial property or an investment property, just like your personal property. The only difference is you can't ask for a payment from the recovery fund if it's an investment property. They have to be licensed, right? They have to be licensed. Yeah. Right. So if you're so that and, and that's the other part of it. If you call and complain because the person came and did your HVAC work and they weren't licensed, you're screwed. You might be able to go to a court of law and adjudicate something, but it's very unlikely that you'll ever get a claim on that. And here's the last part, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you. We have there are rules about how many properties you can build and sell without a license. Does everybody under, know that here in the room, right? You are limited for your own properties and how many properties you can go and make improvements to, and then turn around and sell until you're required to get a contract license. And the reason is, is that people used to try to get around having a contractor's license by like, oh, I'm going to build this for myself. Yeah. It's my own house. Well, it's funny. You've had six houses this year. Yeah, I move <laughs> around a lot, right? And so they, they put restrictions in to say that you have to live in a house, I think it's one for two years, okay? One for two years. Um, Otherwise, if you're selling, if you're turning around selling, otherwise you have to get a contractor's license to do that. Do you know what that limit is? It's one house for every two years. No, I'm saying like if you're flipping a house, like so, how does that work? If it's it only if you're doing the work on the house yourself? Correct. Okay, gotcha. Correct. So if you go and hire a licensed contractor, like an electrician, but a lot of times people, you know, do all their own work, and you know. Um, and they're claiming their, the, the, exception, the exemption because they said they're going to, it's their house, their personal house. Um, and I will tell you that you might not get caught the first two or three times you do that because it takes a while for people to catch on, but they do catch on. And once you're found to be doing that, your likelihood of getting a, li a license in the future is, is very unlikely. When, when they find that you're intentionally violating the laws of Virginia, they're not anxious to be like, ah, yeah, you got away with it for a while. Mm -hmm. we'll, but come on in and get licensed and we'll hook you up and you can, you can do it on your own anyway, right? 
So when you're planning improvements to your properties, keep in mind that you, you know, especially if you're selling, if you're turning them into rental properties, not a big deal. If they're investment property and you're turning them into a rental, you don't have that issue. But if you're, if you're doing it to flip to sell and you're acting as a contractor on an investment property, you will run into problems eventually over time with that process. So keep that in mind when you're doing that. If you're GCing it yourself, but there's subs doing it that are licensed, does that get around it? Or is that considered yeah. you being working as a contractor? It, it depends on the stuff that you're doing yourself. Okay. It depends on the stuff you're doing. I mean, if you're acting as a GC on an investment property, they're gonna, they, they want you to be licensed. I know some states like won't let you GC your own properties. Like South Carolina, yeah. you have to. Yeah. Virginia to will. Know. Yeah. When they say GC, it, it depends on what you mean by being a GC. I guess if you're talking about, hey, yourself. I called the painter and yeah, I called yeah. the drywall guy and I called the electrician and they were all licensed again, that is not a thing. If you're going and pulling a permit and you're managing yeah. an addition, you're doing structural changes to the property and you're the, and you didn't you don't have a contract license and you're pulling the the permit for those works, then you're going to have to be licensed. Gotcha. Unless you're just doing one every two years. Right. Right. Um, so I just wanted to make sure you understand when you're going to use a contractor, make sure that they're licensed. Make sure that you see their insurance. And I hate to tell you all this. Make sure you call and check the insurance. Okay. Um, I, I, I will tell you, we're a GC. We have been for a long time. Every, I would say one out of every five new contractors that come to us wanting to do work submits to me fake insurance certificates. Hmm. And guess what? If they give you a fake insurance certificate and something happens, uh, they don't pay you in fake dollars. You, you, there's, no, there's no case. You don't get anything. And yeah. Well, so you, they, send, they send you a certificate. And the insurance company is on there. And you call them up and be like, hey, I got an insurance certificate from Acme Flooring. Just wanted to make sure that they're, that they're currently insured. And I, I, I will, it's sad, but I will tell you, often they will say they were insured, but they, 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 their expiration was six months ago. Well, that's weird because uh, the certificate I got shows that their expiration is next year. Hmm, no, uh, uh, that, I think that might be an error. And they, they like do the Michael Jackson moonwalk backwards because hmm. they don't want to get their person in trouble. Right. But that just tells you, if you're willing to fake an insurance certificate, I'm not sure that's the kind of people you want to be in business, you want to hire, right? So make sure they're licensed, make sure they're insured, on, and check the insurance certificate. Make a phone call and check to make sure, okay? Um, license. It's so easy. DPOR.com, Virginia DPOR. All you just Google Virginia DPOR. D, D David O. Um, uh, Paul Robert. The <laughs> first thing that comes. Did I say that right? No. That, <laughs> That's okay. Did I get that wrong? Dyslexic, <laughs> dyslexic much. Yeah, yeah. Like professional like occupancy and regulation. It's the right, Department right. of Professional Occupancy <laughs> and Regulation. So DPOR. It's like that meme with all. Those. <laughs> yeah, D David, Paul, you know, Oliver, you know, uh, Robert. Reggie. Anyway, if you just Google that, the, it, it takes you to the home page, and the first thing on that page is license lookup. And you just put the name in, and it'll come up and be like, yep, this person doesn't have a license. And that's the last part that I'll share with you, and then I'll take some, a few questions, is even if you're doing an investment property and you're not eligible to go to the contractor recovery fund, you're still eligible to report that trade contractor for disciplinary reasons if they screw you. And I will tell you this, and how many of you have run into this? I did a project and they did a great job for 85% of it and then I just couldn't get them to come back to fix this and I couldn't get them to come back. They stopped taking my call. They wouldn't return my call. Guess what? Huh? They left town, right? Yeah. Guess what? They don't care if you file a lawsuit because you had to spend the time and the money on it and maybe they don't have a lot of assets and maybe they don't care and they'll wait till the last second to pay it. But what? 
you follow a complaint with the board of contractors and the board can take their ability to make a living, they respond to you immediately. I tell people all the time, you call people a couple times and they don't return your calls, file a complaint with DPOR. I guarantee you, when DPO calls them and says, we received a complaint um, and you, we need, you need to answer this complaint, because they send an investigator. The board of contractors has the second largest investigative staff in Virginia behind the state police. They have investigators all over the state and all they do is go and look at complaints that consumers make about licensed contractors. And by the way, some of the times the complaints are absolute bullshit, pardon my language. Sometimes it's, I'm, I'm unhappy because I wanted my wall painted green and I picked the color, but I didn't like how it turned out. I want the contractor to repaint it, but I don't want to pay for it. And they say, no, this is the color. And I say, I want you to repaint it. No, I can't do that. I already painted it. And then they file a complaint to the board and the board looks at it and the board says, hey, this is not a regulatory matter. If you, this is a, an issue that you need to take to a civil court, right? But if it's, uh, I paid a deposit and the person didn't show up, that's a regulatory matter. Or if you paid them and they did a project and they didn't show up to finish it, they did 90% and didn't show up for the last 10, they didn't honor their warranty, or they abandoned the project. These are things that they can lose their license. They can lose their ability to make a living. And so uh, I encourage you, when you do these things, make sure you use someone who's licensed. Make sure you use someone who's insured. It only takes one project to ruin you financially if you use someone who's not licensed and insured and they screw you. It, it could cost you thousands and thousands of dollars and you, you might have done really well on this one and this one and this one and you're doing great and, and then all of a sudden you use this one and you get screwed for thousands and thousands of dollars and all this other hard work was for nothing. Okay, So it's very easy to check licenses when you get those insurance certificates. And by the way, if you ask a, a contractor for an insurance certificate, and they act like you don't know what they, you know, what, what, uh, oh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, sure, we can get you. Listen, this is standard practice. It is standard practice. If somebody even hesitates about giving you an insurance certificate, chances are that they've got a problem. I mean, it's so easy. I, I'm just like, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll, my, my insurance agents, they, insurance agents send them out all day long every day for projects, okay? So those are the things you want to do. Keep in line the limits. Um, and, um, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. And I, you know, I want to start off with what are we building for a square foot? Yeah. Anyone want to know we'll that? Number one. Yeah. <laughs> any questions? Yes, ma'am. Because I'm new to the area. Yeah. So sheathing that's covered in plaster, is it okay to put sheetrock on top of that? Well, sure. I mean, but you do have to make sure you. I mean, you, you, you don't want to cover up things that can't be covered up. So generally, can you take new drywall and cover up la old lath and plaster? Sure you can. But it has to be done correctly, which means, you know, you might need to have fastener, you know, stru structural members that are put in place to make sure that the new drywall is supported correctly. So it's not just as easy if you go and you see a wall and it's like, oh, I'll just put a piece of thing. You also need to know, is there electrical behind it? You know, am I covering up a vent? There are other things that you need to make sure that you do, but generally, you can cover up old lath and plaster with new drywall, generally. And lath and plaster, remember, when we're all in this situation where we're all looking for older properties and properties that we can potentially rehab. And um, lath and plaster is a pain in the butt. I mean, you get into these older, older houses that had, you know, basically lath and plaster, which is, it was a drywall front, and then they put chicken wire, and then they used this heavy duty, and it thick. And a lot of times they insulated um, with horse feathers and other stuff. I mean, like newspaper. Yeah, I mean, all sorts of stuff. Um, we have those around here. Yeah, yeah, we really do. I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, um, I, I did a, a restaurant in Caswell that, had, uh, that was a 200 year old building, and it had been a school. Um, it had been um, uh, a community center, and before we started making a restaurant, it was a funeral home. Hmm. And uh, real, real, I'll tell you a quick story about this. I went down to do an evaluation to the property, and um, when the funeral home had closed, the local high school used it for a couple years to do a haunted house in where they made some money, right? I, I did not know that. Nobody told me that. So I'm, I'm do, we're there during the day. I'm doing, checking out the attics and all these systems and whatever, and so we're getting ready to leave, and it's twilight. 
and everybody's getting their car and leaving. I was like, damn it, I forgot to look at the uh, casket shaft in the back of the building where they lifted the caskets to the various levels of the, when it was a funeral park. And I was like, oh man, I said, I don't want to drive back. So I was like, I'll go. So I get a flashlight out of my car and I go down and I unlock it and I, you know, walk in, I'm, you know, looking, you know, around, check to see what's the structure of, because we're going to have to demo that was going to be demoed. What kind of old casket lift did it have in there? And um, I walk through and I get to the shaft and I do this and I turn around and I do this. And at that old haunted house, they had left a ghoul head, <laughs> like in the in the shaft of that thing. And I'm not gonna tell you, uh, it not scared the crap out. I, 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 I dropped all my and I was and I was like, I was like, what was it? And I you know, it sort of went back in and I was like, <laughs> so uh, you never know what you're gonna find when you start looking through stuff. Um, we did a one of the things my company did. Um, um, for a long time, we, we designed and built fraternity and sorority houses on college campuses all across the country. And I was doing a project up in Pennsylvania, and it was an old fraternity house, and they wanted to basically demo one section of the house and build a huge addition on it. And um, so we were there first couple of weeks, and we were starting to do demo, and we tore walls, and it turned out there was a secret room in the fraternity house, and they and somebody had collected and actually like collected and put it in plastic, vintage Playboys. Oh. And there were like four boxes of them. And I asked the fraternity, I was like, what do you want to do with this? And she was like, he's like, oh, that's just home away, whatever. We took him to a local shop and got like $2,000. Oh, it was bet. great. <laughs> so you never know what you're going to find when you start carrying into stuff and demoing uh, stuff. So, um, so one question um, that I have, you started talking about like some regulations and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and I know obviously being on the board of contractors and um, the home builders association, which also if anybody like, if you're looking for people to call or you are subbing stuff out um, the home builders association, which we're a member of, I know some of the other people in here is a great resource to try and find like a roofer or um, you know, any really subcontractor, even somebody to come clean your carpet. They have a list of members that are vendors and builders. And, everything and you can like search that. it by trade, right? So exactly. You can put in there, so, you know, so plumber. that's a good resource if you're looking for people or you're new to the area and need, need some help. Uh, those people are pretty vetted. But my question was going to be, are there any like regulations or changes to the building code or anything in the pipeline that we may not be aware of when you are doing those initial um, you know, evaluations where it could change your numbers like drastically in certain areas? Or, okay. or something that we need to look out for, you know? So the voting code changes every three years. Right. Um, it's adopted. So um, it's the, uh, in Virginia, um, um, they, they take the national code and they have a, 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 um, a board like the Board of Contractors. Uh, Steve Simonis was on that board, John, um, a few years ago that took all the suggestions and the, and the current national building code and then they go through and say, okay, we're going we're gonna to eliminate that and not require it in Virginia, but we're going to add this and make it even more restrictive right. or whatever in Virginia. So keeping up with that in the profession is important. When it comes to remodeling houses, there's usually a threshold you have to go over before the building official will require you to bring it up to current code. And let me just tell you this, you always want to avoid that threshold. Right. If you get to a point where you think that the improvement you're going to do to this property is going to push you to the point where you have to bring the entire house or building for a reasonable amount of money. Um, there, are, there are some exclusions and some exceptions, um, and a lot of the architectural community works with that. There's rehab codes and other things that you could potentially get into. But I will just tell you this, every time they create an exception to something, there's always a trade-off. Yep, we'll let you rehab this old building and not bring it up to current code, except we want you to have solar panels and we want you to have this and that. And when you add all that stuff up, and you take this and it's like, well, shit, I could have just rehabbed it to the current code. Right. I mean, so there, there are thresholds for that. Um, yep. I, I'm, I'm trying to think more than 40% of the, 
of the total square footage. I think I'm going off the top of my head. John, you might know of this. 40s, I think it's more than 40% increase of square footage. Or if you do work that increases the overall value of the property by 50%. I know change of use too is a big thing. Oh, so yeah, change of use is you're always changing, yeah. especially in commercial life. Oh, you're commercial, changing, yeah. you're going to change usage, you're bringing that to current code. Right. Same 100%. thing with multifamily if you're adding units. Yeah. Um, you know, you can add bedrooms as long as they yeah. conform and stuff That's like right. that. But if you're if you're going from a you know a nine plex and turning it into a a twelve plex somehow, uh, that's going to be something that particularly um, the accessibility standard. Mm -hmm. And and let me and let me say this to you as far as you know if you're ever looking at apartments and stuff. Um, I grew up uh, with an aunt who who was a ballerina in New York City when she was sixteen years old professional ballerina and she contracted polio and ended up being paralyzed from the waist down the rest of her life. My aunt just passed away at 89 a few, a few uh, months ago. Okay. Um, I have always in my entire life uh, been cognizant about ADA accessibility standards. It's something that's important to me because I saw my entire life, my aunt struggle with bathrooms at church and at going to relatives houses for parties. So I have always been someone that particularly in the stuff that we design, Hey, let's make sure we have a three-foot hallway. Let's make sure we have doors. That is something I was doing because it was important to me because I grew up seeing it before the building code made you change to it. But now the building code has changed and said, if you're doing a ground, if one level house, that ground floor has to be completely accessible. You have to have an accessible size bathroom. You have to have accessible size pathway for a single family home. And why are they doing that? So that somebody has the option to buy that property who may be disabled. Um, it has added cost to it because if you're doing a, a three foot or four foot hallway as opposed to a you know smaller hallway or doors, it can add cost to it. So that is something that you need to think about when you're going into it. Is you know if you're if you try to add on square footage, if you're greatly changing the uh, the overall value of the property, or if you're changing usages, um, those are all going to be things that are going to add and cost you a lot more money. So you're saying if I bought one of the hundred feet down the and I put seventy-five thousand dollars in the trigger, they have to open up all that floor, right? It, it it could, depending on the EDA is really only commercial though, right? No, it's the building code now is requiring ADA standards in new houses and, and new construction. Yeah. Um, you don't have to have a house, you know, for instance, you don't have to put a residential elevator in. Right. If you have a second floor, but you must have, in the, the new building code, an accessible pathway in, to egress to and from the house. And you must be able to traverse the house, including getting to a bathroom with ADA standards. Do the bathrooms have to abide by the same like? No, you know? they they don't. They're not making them be like a commercial ADA bathroom. Right, right. But they have to be made so that somebody in a wheelchair can get to a, get into to a bathroom. It. Okay. So that, that, new stuff. that triggers too, like, you know, the the pricing point is probably hard for them to enforce. But if you have to pull a permit, right. If you have to pull a building permit, which in Christiansburg and Blacksburg, like most things that you do, they're going to make you. To like most likely pull it. You're getting in anything that involves structural work, heating, air conditioning, I mean, heating and cooling, plumbing, you know, structural work, power, electrical issues. You're going to end up having to pull a permit. And that's where that review, when you're going to do a permit, you have to give them a plan. You have to tell them what you're doing. And you have to give them the estimate amount of cost. And some jurisdictions don't pay a lick attention to that. And some jurisdictions do. I'm not going to tell you which jurisdictions don't pay it, but you can probably figure it out if you're thinking about it. You can probably tell the ones that are more that more scrutinize mm -hmm. those things than others do. Right. Some places, Giles, for instance, Giles, listen, they want people to come and live, so they're less restrictive. Um, they're more flexible mm -hmm. um, because they're encouraging growth and need and want and need growth. Right. Um, Blacksburg is going to be a different story. Blacksburg is, is, is going to hold you to the letter of the law on everything they can. Yep. So, so yeah. if you are going in there and you're taking out cabinets and stuff like that in the kitchen, 
That would not trigger. So that's a great. That's a great question. This case, we, we used to have this on the board. So, with the board of contractors, we would get disciplinary cases all the time, and a lot of them would involve a, a licensed contractor is not permitted to use an unlicensed subcontractor. So, if I'm a licensed general contractor and Cody just messes around with plumbing on the weekends, I can't hire him to do plumbing work. He has to be licensed for me to be able to hire him. Okay. A lot of times what would happen is a GC would, would start doing a project like a kitchen. They're remodeling a kitchen, but they moved a couple outlets. They changed an outlet from a standard to a GF, a ground fault interrupting circuit. Um, they ran a water line to an ice maker for the refrigerator, new refrigerator. All those 